I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to the show. U.S. history is a history of progress, right? We love to celebrate our movement towards a more inclusive, fairer society. But is our grand narrative really true? This year, while the first black president marks the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, you'd be forgiven for thinking we as a country had reached a pinnacle of racial justice. And in a sense, we have. But history is not quite that straightforward. In fact, black Americans never had more representation in government or more successful black-run towns than they did after the Civil War during the same era as white supremacy and Jim Crow. Our guests today have attempted to document that story. Edward Harris Jr. is an award-winning documentary filmmaker with over a decade of experience in television and production. He was also the director of operations for the African Heritage Network. His newest film, The Lessons of Haiti, examines the unique history of black self-sufficiency and political power in the U.S. Doug E. Dog is an actor, comedian, and filmmaker. He's appeared in a number of roles on film and in TV. From Cool Runnings to Jungle Fever to the sitcom Cosby, he's also the narrator of Lessons of Haiti. For more than a century, the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company in Durham, North Carolina, has stood as a glowing symbol of black self-determination and business achievement in America. North Carolina Mutual's leadership was very influential in helping black residents of Durham at the turn of the century build one of the most successful and self-sufficient black communities in America. This community was known as Haiti. Haiti then had about, I would only say black one time, one oriental restaurant, three white businesses, 125 black businesses, a barber college, a beauty college, a shoe repair school, a radio and TV repair school, two business colleges, two movie theaters, two hotels. Then, as the civil rights era gained steam across America, the stability of Haiti and Black Durham and the fates of many other successful black communities began to take a different turn. A community once glowing with opportunity became a community in crisis. How could an area that rose to such prominence at the turn of the century become nearly non-existent today? What was the pivotal moment, and who made the fatal decision? The Lessons of Haiti. Your film tells a story that I just thought, why isn't this more generally known? It really turns history kind of on its head. Yeah. Haiti, it's the name of a town. Yes. Tell me more. Okay, um, Haiti was actually a small section of the city of Durham, North Carolina. And this was basically where um, black people lived, where they had their own businesses. And it became the capitalistic, I guess the black capitalism center of America. It became, uh, it, a lot of people talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma, but um, Tulsa was, was nowhere near as sophisticated as Haiti was. Um, it had over 125 independent black businesses. It had uh, restaurants, hotels, movie theaters, um, all run by blacks. And this took place, um, it started right around 1898, right after the Wilmington riots, and carried straight through to like the 1960s when it was destroyed. And this is a story not just of one community, but of many. You say in the film there's more than a hundred of these black towns or communities in this period after the Civil War? Throughout the country. Um, and some of these uh, stories have, were alluded to. Like, for example, in um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, the very powerful book written by Zora Neale Hurston, she references the, or the organization of a small town, which was an actual town in Florida, Eatonville, Eatonville. Florida. And uh, you, you find allusions to this in literature, in all sorts of places. And these were actual wool towns, yeah. So what the heck happened? Well, in the case of Haiti, um, and in the case of Wilmington, because uh, Wilmington was a very, very pivotal location or city at the time, because it wasn't a black town, it was a regular city that ended up being pretty much run by blacks. There was an article in the black newspaper in Wilmington about a lynching that had taken place in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. A black man who was in an interracial relationship with a woman out of Chapel Hill was found hung 
between Durham and Chapel Hill. So it started this sort of debate. He was a well-educated man, and the editor wrote something to the effect of any woman of any color would gladly be with an educated black man. And that basically pissed off a whole lot of people. Um, Josephus Daniels, who was the founder of the News and Observer, which is the biggest paper in North Carolina right now, he ran the article for like three weeks hmm. and just built up this fervor. And they actually released, they said that they were going to go to Wilmington and they were going to riot. So I believe it was a Wednesday night after Bible study. People coming out of Bible study are met with, you know, angry whites from three or four of the adjacent towns. And they basically ran 2,000 people, 2,000 families out of Wilmington overnight. And actually it was a coup and took over the city of Wilmington. Mm -hmm. This is 1898. This was right in the wake of the Plessy v. Ferguson decision. Um, you know, the sep separate but equal. And um, Afro Alfred Moore Waddle was the Democratic leader at the time in that area of North Carolina. He was also a grand dragon of the Klan. Step back a little bit and help us place this story of Haiti, mm -hmm. a community in Durham, North Carolina, mm -hmm. verging on self-sufficiency, self-sufficient by the middle of the 20th century, yes. within the context of the history that we know, mm -hmm. slavery, the end of slavery, reconstruction. Mm -hmm. How did these things fit together? Because um, reconstruction is also the era of white supremacy and, and Jim Crow. In that history line, what gets missed is why the Klan came about. Why did the red shirts and the regulators come about? Um, and it came in three different phases. Um, the first one was just pure racial hatred. Um, the second one was economic jealousy. And what I mean by that is we'll take Rosewood or um, the Greenwood section of Black Wall Street in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example. Um, if you went to downtown Tulsa and you were black, then you had to eat out the back, you couldn't sit down anywhere, and you had to be out of town by sundown. Well, when you got to the Greenwood section, you were treated like a human being. You could come in, people would greet you, sit you down, and what happened was the Chinese, who were there building a the railroad, would go to the black side of town because they were treated just like blacks were in downtown. The Native Americans and the Mexicans all went to the black side of town. So what you ended up happening all over were these establishments, the juke joints, all, you know, um, uh, the soul food uh, spots and all the things that ended up becoming uh, prominent African American culture only existed in these pockets. So if you were Chinese, if you were Mexican, if you were Native American, you would go to those parts of the town and you would spend your money. And you even have people in the film saying they chose to do that to support their own community. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that became a problem because now downtown Tulsa isn't making any money. All of a sudden now downtown Durham isn't making any money. You know, um, so how do we handle this? You know, we come in first, we burn down. Uh, James Weldon Johnson talked a lot about it. We talked about the Red Summer, um, 1919. It was really 1919, like 1922. So it was more than the summer. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, blacks were coming back from World War II. They wanted equal pay for equal time. And this created a backlash. Um, so what you were having was this economic jealousy that was forming. And the only way to get rid of it was to go in and burn these towns down. There were about 43 towns that were destroyed in one summer. Mm -hmm. And when you say destroyed, you don't, um, I don't want to um, mislead you and think that people came in and just burned everything down and left. They came in and they looted the place first. Mm -hmm. So they took people's gold, they took people's, you know, precious, you know, um, heirlooms or what have you. Then they would firebomb the houses. Mm -hmm. So it was really robbery and then rioting that kind of took place. So you have this stripping away of wealth that was firmly established within the 40 years of the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because African Americans were the majority population. Right. Once they were no longer enslaved, that was who was there. Mm -hmm. Then take us to the next chapter, Doug, because at a certain point in the middle of the 20th century, highways get involved. 
Correct. The, the, the third wave that they did not uh, elucidate had to do with the installation of the interstate highway system, which Eisenhower saw in Germany and uh, came back to America and uh, decided that we should uh, have something, a similar kind of network of, uh, of uh, roads uh, to, to create uh, uh, commerce throughout the entire country. Uh, all, all systems that we all enjoy today, that we are know of today, and most of these uh, uh, highways were run right through the black uh, established towns. And what happened to those people, like the woman that you interviewed who was burnt out um, in the attack on the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, mm -hmm. um, but the others too, those who saw their towns destroyed. The, guy, the grandfather who says, sure, you can come and bulldoze this house, but I'll be standing outside with a shotgun. shotgun. A shotgun's no match for a bulldozer. What happened to him? That is the only place in Haiti they have not built on. <laughs> it's really funny. It's really funny. Uh, you know, Haiti was originally <laughs> named after uh, um, Haiti. And um, if you go to Haiti now, if you go to Durham now, St. Joseph's Church has a huge stained glass mural of Washington Duke. And on the other side of the church is a Haitian voodoo symbol that sits on the steeple to this day. And I think that's, I think that that's what the real story is. It's like, you know, you have two cultures that come together and when fear is gone, it blossomed. Mm. And when fear came back, you know, it was destroyed. And what did Haiti mean for those people? Self-sufficiency, um, ownership, um, and enfranchisement. The first country in the hemisphere to throw off slavery mm -hmm. by its labor vault. That's mm -hmm. right. Which really cracked, internationally, cracked the idea of white supremacy. Because up until that point, you know, it was no way to, to beat any of the colonial powers. And he did it with sticks and spears, and you know, which is a wonderful story too. You start the film with the celebration of Barack Obama's presidency. How do you make mm -hmm. sense of this history of, or the story of history now, learning what you've learned through the making of the lessons of Haiti? Well, I've learned that the, the story is in, incomplete um, at worse and inaccurate, oh, well, at best, <laughs> and inaccurate at worst. Um, you learn that it, you can't really um, begin to understand his uh, ascension as an individual and as a political figure without understanding the history of the community that uh, supported him, um, their aspirations, uh, or, or, or the, the way that the community's aspirations are perceived as a result of mm -hmm. his uh, success. Um, all of that can be um, understood more completely by uh, understanding the, the, how, these, uh, uh, how this success was realized so long ago and how the remnants of that success are really, a, are really what we um, uh, sh should understand when we're looking at him. You know? It's not just about an individual. How does it change your picture of yourself, of your community, Edward? I don't know which is worse. This mm -hmm. message you haven't had the ability ever to be a success yet, or you were and it was taken away? I think that um, the knowledge of knowing that you've built something, not once, but twice, and it has been destroyed out of jealousy or out of just, you know, animus, I think it holds a lot of weight, especially when you have these young black kids who are sitting up in these classrooms and they hear all about the slavery, but they don't hear about how these people, with all of this going against them, actually built full towns and churches and hotels and actually built uh, an economy for themselves. You're talking about 10, 10 12 years after slavery. And got you know, themselves elected to the Senate in bigger numbers than we do now. Absolutely. I always um, think it's really interesting, Dr. Malvo in the film says, um, you know, the first entrepreneur, the first black entrepreneur was the slave who decided to negotiate his freedom from his master. So it just changes how you look at our history and you look at yourself. You know, I have a 15-year-old daughter, and when she saw the film, she was amazed. You mean, we had black banks? Like insurance companies? Like, yeah, well, you know, because her orientation to the African-American culture is we brought music, 
Yeah, we were slaves, we were good athletes, but that was pretty much about it. Mm -hmm. After that, we're, you know, for the most part looking for a handout. We want the government to take care of us, you know, um, which has been the, that Republican line for so long, you know, um, which is kind of ironic. It's like you come in, you burn down my house, now you're complaining because I'm looking for somewhere to live. <laughs> but America's not going to get any better. Not just politically, but economically too. Absolutely. Most importantly, economically, because as we know now, economics runs the politics. But there are people that look at this picture and they say, this is a country where economic strength is supposed to rule. Mm -hmm. And yet, even when we built economic strength, it was taken away. You could give up looking at that. Um, I really think it's the human spirit. Um, you know, um, you keep pushing and we're determined to find that space. We're determined to find that space and to define that space for ourselves. And it may not be this year, it may not be in our lifetime. I think it will be because the millennials now are not going for any of it. I would suggest that you know, they figure out a way to utilize this new knowledge to make America better as a whole. Well, I want to thank you for your film, Lessons of Hate Time. Yeah, thank you for having thank us. You.